I'm a lot more emotional than I used to be. I wasn't expecting this to take me around that. Wow. Mr. John Fisher! John Fisher! <laughs> Is it an over-exaggeration to say that comedy saved your life? I didn't wake up one morning and decide to be a comedian. I'd gone corporate world, do this, do that. I was on 60 grand a year, I had a good pension, I had all of those things. But my wife, we, we split up, I lost her. Comedy, it gave me a life that, that saved the person that I was. Was I going to be the person that I am sat here before you? 50-50. This episode is supported by Huel. Welcome to High Performance. Thank you. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, when I looked at the list of people you've had, I think I was the only one I didn't know. It was quite impressive. <laughs> is it an over-exaggeration to say that comedy saved your life? On more than one occasion. It's not an over-exaggeration at all. I think it's the... I've come, I've made the decision um, that this is, as I say, the, the thing I want to do most and certainly for the next five years. And I'm, go I'm going to be 60 in 2026. And I had a corporate job. And the reason that the, the significance of that number is everything would have kicked in. The pension would have kicked in. And, you know, your whole career is built, mm -hmm. built to the fact that there's, a, there's an exit. And when I turn 60, I've decided that year, so I've got a big tour next year that's, you know, or an arena tour next year in October 2025. And then after that, I'm going to spend time outside the UK, going to Canada, America, Australia, New Zealand. Canada and America, I'm starting off, I'm in clubs. And I was talking to my wife about it and I said, you know, the idea of starting off when I worked in the pharmaceutical industry again, at 60, wouldn't fancy it. I said, the idea in my 60th year of being on a comedy club lineup in Denver on a Thursday night, I said, just floats my boat. I just love the essence of it. And so the reason when you, when you said it's about saving your life, I was so close a couple of years ago of just saying, I've, I've had enough. I've, I've, I, 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 financially, we're okay. It's also, I don't have to do this. And oh my God, I can't. I, and I, 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 I'd finished the tour, I went home and I'd, I'd done a chat show and I just, and I just atrophied. I just found my relationship with the world getting smaller and smaller. And it was Melanie that just said, just go and do a gig. You don't, don't do a gig because you're thinking of doing a tour or just go back and do a gig because you're a miserable get. And honestly, it's, it's the zest I've got for it now because I'm, I'm going to new places yeah. like America is exactly the excitement I had when I began. But people might listen to that story and say, okay, so comedy makes you happier. But that doesn't mean it saved your life. When I say it saved your life and you say, yeah, on numerous occasions. Yeah. Explain that. Well, well, was I stood on the edge of a bridge going to jump off? Uh no, I wasn't going to do that. Uh, was I going to be the person that I, that I am sat here before you? Oh, 50-50. It was 50-50 whether, whether I would be this person. You know, I, I, for people who don't know my story, I started late. I started because I'd split up with my wife. I started because it was miserable. I started at a comedy club not expecting anything of it. I did that for I didn't I didn't wake up one morning and decide to be a comedian right. and and what happened I I found myself again because the person I'd become when I got married was so driven I was I was driven to do the things that I thought you should do as a as a young father mm. like what make money get on get some security you know, I get in the corporate world and work hard and head down. And I was your classic. I'd be away for three days at a sales conference. I'd put my key in the door. My wife would be there with, you know, three kids under the age of four. And I'd like uh, kiss her on the kiss her on the head, pat the kids and go upstairs on my mobile phone to the office making phone calls. I was that person. 
and I lost my sense of silliness that you have to have in stand-up comedy. Right now, on a Friday in London, I'd have probably been ordering a bottle of Bordeaux on expenses and going and thinking yeah. I've, I've, I've done well. And that's, that's not the life that I'm living now. Because when you got into comedy, your, your marriage had broken down, right? Yeah. And I know that for you, this is a familiar story, but I still think for a lot of people, um, this audience in particular, they won't necessarily know this. Like, what did a day in the life of you look like around that time when the marriage had broken down and the comedy hadn't yet started? And uh, Well, so I got married. Well, let's, let's, put it, let's put a few things in perspective. So I, um, I went to a comprehensive school. I was the first one in the family to go to university. I knew I just had to get off the estates, whichever way it was going to be. I, I always thought, you know, sport might be the reason. I ended up going to college, getting a, getting a degree, got a job as a salesman because um, uh, I needed a job because I'd been in America coaching football and I'd run up a six and a half thousand dollar phone bill. Right. And the reason I'd run, done, done this, right, is because I was waiting for a company called North American Soccer Camps. And the year before, everybody had what was a magic number to make phone calls back to the office. And, and somebody gave me this magic number this year that I was there. And I drove a car across America after I'd finished working there. And I drove all the way back to Connecticut from L.A., to uh, have an interview, to have a full-time job in America. And, uh, and when I got there, the Gary Russell, who was the, the manager, said that, who, who owned the place, said, look, yeah, we can do this. We'll organise a green card. You've got an opportunity now to live in America. And I thought, this is great. The only problem I've got is I've met this girl in Manchester, but that's fine, I'll work this out. I said, can I phone me mum and dad? He said, well, it's, you know, obviously, yeah, but it's expensive. I said, it's okay, I've got this magic number. And this is, honest to God, what happened, I sat there and I put the number in in front of him and he went, he said, can you write that number down? I said, yes, so I gave it to him. I said, yeah, honestly, smash it. I've been giving it to everyone. He went and got it, came back. It was his credit card. So the people who worked for the company the year before... This is all true on my kids' life. <laughs> had used his credit card number with his what? authority to make phone calls for AT and T. I thought it was so mad. I don't know what I thought. So I, so he, <laughs> he literally came back in. There was a lad called Paul Lawrence working and there. He went, I said John, this isn't. I said, so he said, look, you'll have to pay this off. He said, we'll still give you the job. You can come back. He, he said, but we will. I said, he don't money for this phone bill, but whatever it is when it comes in. And I, and I sat there, I went, nah. I said, you'll never trust me again, and I don't blame you. I said, but I promise I will pay you back. And I went, and then, you know, this is, this is the 80s, isn't it? So it, it's about a month or something, this thing came through, this phone bill. It was like that. And it added up to six and a half thousand dollars, four thousand pounds. And I, I I was playing semi-pro football at Southport and I, and, I, and I went and got a job as a sales rep for a drug company because it was a good job, got a car, and I started to pay. And I paid them back, took me a year, and I paid them back. But I was in then, I was in the corporate setup. The girl I was scared of leaving, I started seeing properly. We ended up going, going and then after about three, three years, I think we did the job, she wants to get married. And I didn't, and, I, and, and so I said, I need to do something before I get married. So I took a bicycle to Australia, and I rolled it back from Australia, right, because I didn't want to get married. So then I did that, and, and in the end, got back, married her. But they kept the job open. So again, I got sucked straight back into the corporate yeah. world. So I'm in the corporate world, and I thought, I, we had kids, it was 26, all of a sudden I had kids, and I thought, I've just got to get my head down. Started studying for a master's degree in business. Get me head down, get me head down, get me head down. And then I lost her. I, I, I lost her. Uh, and we, we split up. Um, and How did you lose her? Because we... How did I lose her? I suppose I placed what I thought was most important was financial security because I came from a 
a background where there was less financial security. That was the thing that I thought was the priority. And uh, and so, and I think I lost there because the best of me was given to everyone else. The best of me was given to work. The best of me, you know, I would spend time with the kids. But to be fair, I don't think uh, if I was a dad now, I'd have been, I'd be a better, I, I think that as most men, I'd be a better dad because I'm a better person. I just realize what's important. Whereas then it was like, you know, sure, the kids are all right. They'll just put a video on. It was a little bit like that. And then, um, and so we drifted apart. We split up. And so the person I was then to come back to your question, I, I would pick the kids. I didn't want to be one of those dads who didn't see the kids, but I couldn't be a part-time dad because I, my work was I was a sales and marketing director for the country. So I was responsible for the UK and Ireland for a drug that stopped people rejecting their organs after the transplants. So it was a very involved job. So I couldn't say I'll always be there on a Wednesday, but what I could say is I could pick them up from school on a Friday and I could drop them back on a Monday. So I had the kids every weekend. And at that time, they were five, three, and one. And so I would work all week, have them all weekend, and that's when I got closer to them. That's when I became a bit more of what yeah. I thought a dad should be. But on a Monday, Jesus, I crashed. Jeez, giving your kids back and not not being able to see your kids. You know what I mean? That arrangement where you don't see them, you know, don't come on a Wednesday because you're going to disrupt things. Even And then and all, those, all those sad stories that everyone's done where you sit outside your wife's house watching her pull the bedroom curtains where the kids are. I think, this is... Sh this is So Mondays, I have actually invented working from home. I don't know if anyone knows this. It's got nothing to do with COVID. I said to my boss, Mondays, I'm dropping the kids off. Can I work from home? And I'll phone the sales team. We'll have a big conference call. And we'd do the conference call. That'd finish in the morning. I'd set everyone objectives. And then, and then, and then no one... No, no one could get hold of me then. And then I'd, I'd have a bottle of wine watching Richard and Judy going, oh my God, that's... And you could, what, just get drunk and wallow? And, 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 and then I thought, I'll stop doing that. I'll try and do something. But it was Monday night. I was 34 years of age. It was, you know, just... You know, the gag is that I, you know, I'd go out on a Monday night and do what you do when you're 34. So I tried lap dancing, but I wasn't very good. You know, <laughs> <laughs> did it! <laughs> So you want to try Huel, but you don't know where to start. Well, let's start with the fact that we all like different stuff. So Ben, behind the camera, he loves the ready to drinks, whereas I really enjoy the daily A to Z vitamins. Well, this is the Huel Taster Bundle, and you can try the lot with eight ready to drinks, six A to Z daily vitamins, eight complete nutrition bars, two hot savory pots, and a free Huel T-shirt. All you have to do is click the link in the description to unlock your offer now at Huel.com slash high performance. And then the story, the big story, is that I went to the Frog and Bucket in Manchester, comedy club. I'd been to the comedy store once and I'd been to the Frog and Bucket once. They were my only experience at comedy clubs at that time. And I thought, well, it'll be like it was last time I came with 200 people in full, you know, because we'd gone for the mate's 21st. And uh, the guy on the door said, it's four pounds to get in unless you put your name down. I didn't even, I said, what for? He said, because it's an open mic night. And I didn't even know what that meant. I said, what does that mean? He said, well, it means if you put your name down, your name gets called out, you go on stage, but it also means you don't have to pay four pound. And I thought, well, I'm getting divorced. So that's four pounds she's not getting. <laughs> that's the gag, but, but that is true. Yeah. So I put my name down, expecting there to be 200 people in there with 80 people put their name down, whatever, and never having to get up. And I put my name down, there were seven people in there. I got called out second. My life changed in those 15 minutes. I found myself on stage. Bizarre. There's loads of things about being on that. It, it, again, the joke that I've said in the stories in the past, which is true, the guy before me was literally doing chicken impressions. <laughs> the compere was Mick Ferry, who's a brilliant comic. And, uh, and I thought, he came on, I thought, does he know there's no one here? And then this fella came on doing chicken impressions that were bonkers. It was like, hey, have you ever seen a chicken driving van? And I'm like, <laughs> freaking hell. 
And when I say my life changed in 15 minutes, if I'd have been called out third, I might have already left. And I got called out second, walked on stage, never been on stage before. I remember going, geez, your lights are bright. There's, there's, a, there's a flashing light when your time's up. I didn't know, even know how long I had. So I remember when the light started flashing, going, oh, your light's broke. And I just carried on. And I just... So uh, what did you say, though? Oh, like, mate, on, the honest thing I said, I walked on at the time... So this was 2000, October 2000. At the time, the big thing in the news was French farmers were blocking the borders yeah. because of oil disputes or something. And so English lorry drivers couldn't get home because you couldn't cross the border in France. And I'd said something to me, mate, uh, that afternoon. I thought, oh, oh, oh that's, that's funny, that. And then I found myself in this comedy club. I thought, I'll say it again, which is the worst thing ever to say, oh, I've said it to me, mate, he thinks it's funny. That's the one th rule that you learn in comedy. It's not funny to strangers. Although it was, it was uh, I walked downstairs, so, oh, geez, you're late to price. And then I went, anyway, um, seeing them French lorry drivers blocking the borders, hey, wouldn't it have been handy if they'd have done that in 1939? That was it. <laughs> and I got, I got a similar sort of, from the six, seven people in the room. And then I, I remember distinctly there was a second where I thought, I oh, just get off. What well, what are you doing? And then I remember thinking, why, what, why, why, what what, what, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna go on to an empty house. You know, what have I got to lose? There's only seven people here. One of them thinks he's a chicken, so there's nothing to lose. And I just literally just went, I'm only here because I'm getting divorced. And I just started talking about getting divorced. And I cannot, I cannot remember. Anything that I said, apart from the lights flicking and me going, oh, your lights broke. And then they actually played the Pearl and Dean music da -da 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 -da, to get me off. Right? So I don't know how long I did, 20 odd minutes or so when I was meant to do five. And then Mick and the guy who ran the place, David Perkins, just came over and said, babe, you've been doing your comedy. And I said, I've never done it. And he went, we're here on a Monday. Just come every Monday. Try and think of jokes. You, you, there might be something in this. You might be. You, you might have something. He said that all the stuff, you know, was good. He said the bit where he started to talk about divorce and started crying. He said, "Don't, don't do that next oh, week." Right. <laughs> did, you, did, did you? No, I didn't. I didn't cry. <laughs> but he said, "But I did talk about divorce. Just mm -hmm. come." And that was it. I ended up having somewhere to go. I ended up. I ended up having something to talk about. I ended up having something to look forward to. So when you asked to save me life, it yeah. gave me a life. It gave me a life that that saved the person I was. But can I ask you what about story. like the job you were doing for a pharmaceutical company where you are the UK sales guy, you've got a status, you've got a name, a reputation there, and then the willingness to go and be the beginner, to go and put yourself into the arena where you've never done it before and you can fail spectacularly. Yeah. What was the mindset shift there between those two? Because I can imagine there's a fair bit of ego that got oh, yeah. in the way. Oh, yeah. Well, to complete the story, because it's very important that within life, you, everyone understands your motivation, because sometimes your motivation is not as obvious as, as people think. And what happened with me is I started doing the stand-up comedy. I kept it to myself. I didn't tell anyone. I didn't, tell, I didn't even tell me mates. I didn't, literally kept it to myself. Uh, I remember taking the kids one night because I got booked to do a Saturday night after I'd been doing it for a few months. And that's when I had the kids. And I, and I took my kids to my mum and dad's to say, look, can you babysit them? And my mum was going, well, why were you doing it? I said, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to a comedy club. And my dad's going, well, he's, he's obviously got a date, like, yeah. let him go. I said, no, I'm, I haven't got a date. He said, well, what are you going to a comedy club for? I said, well, because, I said, I'm doing it. I'm going to get up and be a comedian. My mum's sitting down going, oh, Jesus, John, is it that bad? Has <laughs> everything gone that far wrong? <laughs> she said, what are you doing that for? You're going to make a show of yourself. <laughs> it's like that old Bob Brookhouse show, okay? Yeah. That's I was going to be a comedian and they laughed. And yeah, exactly. Laughed. And it was so, because it was so alien, you know what I mean, the idea of it. And, and obviously she got to see me uh, live the life that I live and it's been brilliant. But I ended up one night getting a phone call. This is the big, I suppose, the big heartfelt bit and the, the truth of it and, it, and it and it informs everything else. I got a phone call. Someone had dropped out at the, the, uh, the Frog and Bucket to go along and fill in. 
and, and do the middle spot 15 minutes. At this point, I've been doing it for about six months. And uh, I used to do this joke when I say, I'm really sad at the moment. I split up with my wife, too, and she'd go, oh, go, it's not that bad. We're not divorced or anything. I've just killed her. But I knew <laughs> I was going to miss her, so I've kept her head in the fridge, which is, you know, it was, it's questionable. <laughs> as well. But it's edgy. I, I, I stood on the stage, I said it, and I looked to the left, and the head that was meant to be in the fridge was sat in the audience. And I remember thinking, because oh, we were at that point, we were at decree nice side, we'd agreed the divorce, we were just trying to sort out the financials, decree absolute, we'd been apart about 20 months. And I remember thinking, Jesus, that joke's gonna cost me another 20 grand. It's not that funny. And and I remember getting through it uh, and thinking, oh God. And then she came up to me at the, at the bar and I was expecting the arguments because we barely saw each other because of the way I picked the kids mm. up and dropped them off at school. And we were, as I say, well down the line towards a divorce. And, uh, and she said, that was great. I was expecting a row. She said, you've got that glint back in your eye that, that you lost. She did say, what happened to you? I said, I married you. She said, and then she said, well, can we do something? And we ended up going to Relate. We ended up getting back together. And that, so I got my family back. I got, and that is where I owe comedy this life yeah. saving thing. I got that back. And so when you look at the motivation to then go, I'm now going to start something new. I've been doing it for five or six years. People are at starts have been on the circuit, Alan Carr, Michael McIntyre, Jimmy Carr. They'd started to go on. I never when I when I got back with Melanie, I sat her down, I said, Look, you've seen me do comedy. I said, I give any I cannot give it up. I said, it's gonna be hard because obviously I'm working in the week and I'll be doing that over the weekend. I said, but I can't give it up. And she said, I don't expect you to. She said, I saw the difference, so don't give it up. Then when it came to a point of me thinking, and I need to decide, that, you know, you get booked, you're the headline in all the clubs in the country, you go on, you smash. Comedy is a real meritocracy mm -hmm. because at that night in that room, no one can argue with who made more people laugh. It becomes yeah. obvious. So, and then you realize there's a window that people are asking you to do bits of telly. And, and I was being asked to do the Jonathan Ross, the warm up for the Jonathan Ross show right. by my agents. I was saying, I've got a sales meeting. And he's going, Madonna's on. Like, like you, and everyone's coming involved in telly. It's a way people see you. I said, well, I've got a sales meeting. And I, and I remember, and this is a true story, Addison Creswell, who was the big showbiz agent who had Jonathan, and I was an underling in his agency. And, I, and he just couldn't get that out of another life. And I remember this, he, he, he got, he, I got this message from Danny, who's my agent, said, Addison wants to meet you, which is like, you know, Al Sir Alex Ferguson wants to meet you. And he was that important. And I'd never met him before. He said, come down to the office in London. I thought, oh, Jesus, it's going to be a big day. So, and I was working on London. So I turned up in my suit. He burst through this door in this purple suit. He went, oh, it's gas. He said, I've heard you got a job. He Give up your job. I'll get you the money. I'll get you the fucking money. I'll get the... He said, I said, well, it's not as easy. He said, he said, what do you earn? 25 grand? I said, no. He said, 35 grand? I said, no. He said, 45 grand? I said, no. He said, 55 grand? I said, no. He said, keep your fucking job. And walked out. <laughs> <laughs> and that's as long as the meeting lasted. And the, but, but when it came to it, I said to Melanie, if I don't give this a go, I'm going to blame the fact that I've got a mortgage and three kids and I'm going to be the man who blames your own kids for me not taking a chance. And she said, just do it. She said, it's not about your job. She said, you, you've got to hold the family together. Mm. She said, I'll give up work so I'm more flexible on time. She said, but if you don't do it, you'll never know. And, I, and, I, and I'd started doing sportsman's dinners midweek. That was bumping me wages up. And I said, if I can carry on doing that, go self-employed, we should be all right. And for the first year, it went like that. The second year, it went like that. And the third year, by the third year, I'd, I'd got everything I could on the, on the house, on the mortgage. I was mortgaged to the hills. And then it just, just went like that. It just turned and went up. But 
can I go back to that meeting that you had with Melanie where where you decided you were going to go in on the comedy scene full time? Because as somebody that said that you grew up in maybe not the most affluent mm. of circumstances, you wanted to get off the estate you'd grown up in. You know, you'd seen your dad go through financial struggles mm. and things like that. And then you've got yourself a really comfy corporate job that you could have stayed in for oh, the next mad. 30 years. To do that still requires a, a bit of a leap and it requires oh. courage. And I wonder if you'd explain courage to us in that context, John. Courage. Wow, that's a good uh, good, good question. Somebody, uh, somebody asked me... Uh, um, somebody asked me a similar question, and the, the instead of using the word courage, the, the, the said confidence, but it's a, it's a similar thing. It's made, and I would say that it's 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 an assessment of consequences. You know, you just look at the consequences. What happens if you get this wrong? And where I'd got to, we were living in Didsbury in a nice house in Didsbury. I'd gone through what I thought was the worst side of things which was not living with my kids and i had this job and when i say it was a good job i mean i was to put it in numbers terms i was on 60 grand a year basic in 2000 you know my when i left my p1160 it was a hundred and seven thousand pounds that year with bonuses and i had boop and i had a car and i had a good pension i had all of those things that even now is a good good wage and I had great prospects absolutely great prospects where they were trying to get me to to move on into into the next bit and the bit where I sat with Melanie and we spoke about it was based on the fact that I was already so far away from where it began that if it went dreadfully wrong I couldn't get back there mm. I just knew I wouldn't get back there I knew if I didn't I backed myself and I backed her, I backed us, because I thought, if this go, we're not going to end up back on our estate. And there's nothing wrong with our estate, but we're not going to end up back there. We'll just have a smaller house. You know, and well, the kids might have to go to a different school then, and I'll have a smaller car, and I'll just have to get another job. And I remember on that third year when things changed, I remember I was putting a business plan together, to, to, and I presented it to the comedy store about doing training, for people using comedy. I was going to go, I had this, this thing where I was going, what we'll do, we'll get salespeople in and I'll talk to them about communication skills and from my work's background and, and then we'll use comedy and then they can get their corporate mates in. They've got to do one gig, which is a five minute piece of comedy, but the whole idea is communication. I had the, I had it all packaged to, to, to go and then, and then I, I got on telly. <laughs> It never happened. Well, I spoke to Mike Pearls of OC. Did you? Remember, yeah. Today's show is in partnership with BetterHelp. And look, I know that sometimes we love that thought that we can do it alone, right? You know, we've got the strength to cope with this. But the truth is that I think all of us need support in our lives. And I come at this from a very personal perspective. When I was in my 20s, I really struggled with my mental health. And you know what? It took me almost two years to finally reach out and have therapy. The moment I did, everything changed. And that's why I passionately implore you if you're thinking about it, have therapy. It was a game changer for me. It could be a game changer for you. And I love partnering with BetterHelp because they make therapy flexible, affordable, convenient, and you can start the process in just minutes. And I'm really pleased to say that thanks to this show, you can get 10% off. All you need to do is go to betterhelp.com forward slash performance for 10% off. That's betterhelp.com forward slash performance for 10% off. Good luck. Just jumping straight into the comedy, I don't know if if you listen to, there's a podcast with the organisational psychologist Adam Grant where he talks to the author Malcolm Gladwell and it's Gladwell who describes comedians as being master psychologists because he says you have to do what you've just described, you have to walk on stage, read the room, understand what's going to hit the funny bone, where something's not going to land as well. And I'm interested in explaining, how do you learn to walk in and read a room like that then? Some of it is intuition. Some of it is, you know, how you come into comedy. Like I was a salesperson before, as we were saying, and, and as a salesperson, you need to read people. 
you need to un, you know you trying to sell something to them you need to get them to like you and you need to to read them a little bit there's an element of that and some of it is the the, 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 I know one of the questions you often ask people is what advice would you give somebody starting out in this field or whatever? And my advice is don't go for the perfect. Anyone wants to do stand-up comedy, don't sit at home until you've come up with the best joke. Get on stage. Get on stage. The more stage... Ta- you never write a better joke, but you make a joke better by no one else to deliver it. So it's all about stage time. And the more time you spend on stage, the more you get that essence of a room, that nuance. I used to walk on before I was known. I used to walk on at like the comedy store. And the first thing that everyone expects a comedian to do in a club is seriously, hey! And I used to walk on and I'd mess about with a stool and everyone would be going, well, it's not, is he starting? And I'd just sit down and go, right, any questions? And people would go, what the... And, and then somebody would shout something out, and then that'd be it. I'd, I'd, off that question, that would be my act. And, and, it, and it, it made an impact because it was low energy, but it was kind of forceful confidence. And how and did I, you cr- come up with that? How did I come up with it? Yeah. As, a, as, a, as an approach? As a concept, yeah. Just because I, th- I think the first time I did... <laughs> The first time I started doing it was at the Edinburgh Festival. Uh, and they had the show on at the Edinburgh Festival called Late and Live, which didn't start till midnight. And you'd be getting on sometimes at half three in the morning after Johnny Vegas had been swinging from a chandelier or something. And so it was chaos and madness and, and, and it was always heckling. And I thought, and everyone was going, right, I'm going to go on, I'm going to beat the audience. I'm going to go on tonight. I'm going to really give them all the energy. You used to try and build up the energy. And I thought, why, why do that? Just, just, I'm getting paid anyway. And so I thought, right, I'm just going to go on. And I start, that's when I started using a stool. I carry a stool and sit down, which is like planting yourself on the stage and go, right, I'm here. It's all right. I'll be funny in a minute. Don't worry about it. And, it, and it's amazing that psychology of that. If you're quiet, the, other, the people who are noisy become quiet. If you're noisy, they'll just get louder. Yep. If you're trying to win them over, they'll get loud. I remember dying on my ass in Newcastle. And it was the one complete death I've ever had. And I remember I knew I was dying because the audience started having a chat. They didn't heckle me. They didn't try It's worse, to, isn't it? They just started going, yes, 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 yes. And, you could, and I thought, oh, my God. And that, twisting that the other way and going, right, I don't need to go, bam, 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 I'm here. I just need to be here. And wait until you know I'm here, and then I'll start. I mean, that be late. Did, again, when we knew we were going to speak to you, John, I, I was looking at sort of the academic angle of of comedy, and I read a paper from 1978 by a guy called Samuel James, who said that like a lot of comedians um, often feel a sense of control over their audience, which helps their mental health. That's one of the, and you're describing almost like controlling the energy in the room, controlling the noise that comes in there. You know what? For a start, I didn't even know there was papers on. I, I, I'd love, not many. I'd, I'd love to get the, these references because I never, I have, I am, if you like, the the least, um, the least students of comedy that there is. I've, right. n- I've not, I never watched comedy. I never, and when I started comedy, I, 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 I everyone else then goes, I'm going to watch loads of comedy because you start doing comedy, and I thought I can't, wa- I can't. Because if I watch someone says a brilliant joke, it'll get in my head. And I don't want to, I I want everything to be, you know, I'm I'm further down the line now and I do enjoy watching other people. But for a long time, I just used to live my life and not think about comedy till it turned up at the club. And so that kind of psychological analysis of it, I can appreciate uh, probably from a different perspective because... I, you know, now I've, you know, in inverted commas, been a success at it. I can understand what drove me to it. I can understand the attraction of it. And part of it is that f- you, are the, you are the one person in the room that's facing the, the opposite way to everyone else. You are, by default, 
either the least important or the most important person in the room, depending on how you approach it. Because you're, you're the least important because you're the one that's not complying with everyone. And you're the most important because you're the only one that they're looking at. If you go through your life, being the third person on stage that night at the comedy club and it doesn't happen, listen to the voice that says to you, just walk off and it doesn't happen. There's moment after moment after moment, if things are just turned yeah. out slightly differently, I mean, you wouldn't be with your wife. You wouldn't be this happy guy sitting in front of us. And I think sometimes people listen to high performance because they're looking for ways to optimise their life, right? And I think sometimes we have to have a really honest conversation that you don't know if no. a moment is going to transform your life for the better or the worst, but you need to find out. Yeah, absolutely, right? And sometimes, sometimes I think the challenge is 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 not waiting for the golden moments. It it's mm. it's not like that. It's like, like you make one decision and that opens five other decisions, and then those decisions are different than if you'd made that decision that you've gone down that route. And, and it is very much sliding more sliding doors. And I see that I see that so often in so many lives. And I see it in my own. And I I read something recently that if you're born in Western society, you should look at your life that based on the fact that you've probably got 4,000 weeks mm -hmm. life. 4,000 weeks doesn't sound like a lot, does it? Particularly as, you know, the first thousand, you haven't really got a decision in. You haven't got any play in. And the last couple of hundred are a bonus. So there's a core bit in there where if, if you put off doing something on Monday till the next week, that's one of your weeks gone. What would you say to people fearful about making those big decisions? Those decisions shouldn't be that big mm. because you should... Like, I evolved to the position of saying, if I don't do this now, I'm just going to be a really good circuit comedian, which is great because the thing is with comedy, and I will always say this, there's not like, there's not an Ed Sheeran in a comedy, there's not an Adele of comedy, there's not someone who's just significantly better than every other comedian. You can go to any comedy club and I urge anyone to do it and they are, the quality is there. It's just some of us have been a little bit luckier or a little bit more consistent or, or at the right time. But honestly, the window of opportunity is very, very small. And I, and I think for some people where they go, I need to make a big decision to change my whole life. You don't. You need to make a little decision to move it towards being able to make another little decision to make another little decision and then you'll find yourself that you've evolved to that position yeah. what are the things from your childhood that are still in there that still sort of rattle around inside i guess you know you might not call it a trauma but certainly the challenges of growing up in a household where poverty was was a was common, right? And it was common among the people that you grew up with. Yeah, but it's, it's, poverty is it's, it's, it's too strong a word. It was a lack of affluence is not the same as right. poverty because a lack of affluence means that, you know, you don't have a, the newest trainers, you don't have a big telly, but you've got a roof over your head. There's always yeah. food on the table. There's, 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 I, 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 I remember writing in my, um, autobiography it was fun it'd be me me and my brother uh had a row about it actually afterwards um because he remembered the difference now and what happened was my dad went to prison when i was six when he went to prison and he was in prison for a full year and when he came out he suffered what a lot of prisoners do when they come out they trying to get a job and and find and work and so on and I remember these distinct memories of me that going out, trying to get a job and coming back in. Because at that time, it was you'd turn up and see yeah. if there's any work that day and stuff. And my perception of success and my way of measuring whether my dad had got a job is if you had cheese. If you had cheese in the fridge, cheese. Cheese seemed an expensive food. And when we got cheese in the fridge, because my dad had been working. And I put that in my autobiography. And my brother, my brother said, oh, that wasn't real. I don't remember that. But, like, he's five years older than me. Mm. So when he was 11, 
and I was six or, you know, he would have been 12 and seven. It was a different, he was seeing the world through his filter. That was my, my perception of it. And that, if there's a ghost in my childhood, it's that. It's, it's, I remember that. I definitely remember that, that measurement, that way of being under tangibly understand mm -hmm. what was going on. Uh, if there's two things that influenced me from childhood was was that going going to see me dad going to see me dad in prison mm. and being because uh, he started off in Preston which is category A so, so you go to the door someone unlocks it and then you walk through with all the families and then they lock it, and then they open the next door, and then they lock it. And just the way you were locked at, the way, just, just the way you felt judged. And I thought, that's not gonna happen. That gave me such a fire in my belly. I remember because it was like, that prison was a bit like, um, like porridge, you all had the same uniform when we got in. My dad gave us texting bars. Mm -hmm. like he'd obviously got his allowance, bought texting bars for us. And we went with my dad's brother, Uncle Freddie, and my mum. And oh my God, I that defined me as saying, right, well, I'm going to get on. I'm going to do my best to. Now that I'm thinking about it, it was my mum. Just the way people looked at your mum. Which is, um, it bothers me a little bit more now because, as I say, the current shows a love letter to because we lost her but last year. But I think just that, I think no one standing in a room and knowing people didn't respect you. Mm. And I thought, that's not gonna happen. That's not that's not gonna happen to my family, to my kids. So I think that was a massive driving force. And then the other thing was a real tragic incident when I was uh, the the year after. Um, I was at the swimming baths in Winsford where we used to live, an outdoor swimming baths, and I'd. Um, I was with my mum and dad and we there was a, an adult pool and a kids pool. I remember playing in the kids pool with a friend from school and then uh, and then I went back to sat with my mum and dad and then there was a bit of a kerfuffle and uh, and I, I remember seeing a fella in in his clothes dive into the water and then pull this kid out. And and then they were trying to do mouth to mouth and pump his chest at the same time, counteracting each other. And an ambulance man came up and it was brutal in some respects, but I think it's probably the best thing that you, you can do. And he just held him up by his foot upside down and all the water gushed out of his mouth. And he was obviously dead. And that was my friend who I've been playing with. And <laughs> there you go. And I remember everyone left the pool. Oh God, it was a weird thing. Everyone left the pool. It was the first time I'd seen the pool empty. And I remember thinking, oh my God, like, like I can have the pool to myself. And I remember diving in and then it was almost like death had got around me. I was cold and I got out and I thought, I thought, and I won't say his name for, for the family's reasons, but I, I remember thinking, oh my God, that's him. And I just knew. I didn't. I wasn't traumatized or shocked. I remember the school assembly about it and all the rest of it. And I remember all of those things. But the, what I took away from it is it can go like that. I, I I'd seen my friend die, and it taught me that I could die, and that none of this was certain. I have to say this: you've took me. I wasn't expecting this to take me around that i wasn't expecting i think the conversation about going into the prison i realized that the judgment then as we were talking wasn't about me it was about my mum
Sure. And that's the bit that got me. How, how does it feel talking about it? Uh, yeah, I listen. I'm I, I'm I'm a middle aged man now, so I, I, I'm a lot more emotional than I used to be. Yeah. I never used to be emotional at all, uh, and I don't mind that. And I and I think also it's a good thing to sometimes have somebody just poke you and go, "Why is that?" Because it's it's that that's why this works. That's why yeah. we told before why podcasts work. When you give somebody space. And a safe environment, they'll, they'll always be able to walk away from it going, I'm glad I got that off my chest. It's a great phrase. I think sometimes the things that are hard for you are not necessarily bad for you, right? Those are hard moments mm. that actually gave you so much in a strange way. So what do those memories do for you now? Oh, they, make, they, they, they make me realise... Like, again, I just uh, on the train on the way in, my wife's just there... Uh, Heard of a, an accident that's happened to someone that she knows who's who's unfortunately been killed in this accident, and I just keep ramming home the phrase that this this is not nothing's guaranteed here. You have to make the most of this, and I'd lost that. That's the bit when you're talking about leaving the job. I'd lost. I'd gone corporate world. Do this. Do that. Do that. Do that. Do that. Because there'll be a good day at the end of it. And 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 my kids will be safe, and we'll have that respect because yeah. we'll have a big house, and we did have a big house, and I had that respect. I had the company car, and and also, incredibly, because I worked for a a an American company then a Japanese company. What was brilliant, and this is you know, not a judgment on anyone else, but my accent would never held me back because mm. they didn't understand that. Someone with this accent wasn't meant to be doing the job I was doing. Amazing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, they yeah, they yeah. never they never saw that limitation because in, in in England, as you know, regional accent can give people a perception of you. And so I I keep coming down to the fact that those things made me go, right, yeah, it's not about what might be there tomorrow. It's about making sure the steps you're taking to get to that horizon are worth taking in their own right. Yeah. and worth enjoying in their own right. But I wonder whether now as a dad, how much of all these amazing and sometimes difficult experiences have informed the way that you you parent your boys? Um, I wish I'd have processed them earlier. I'm processing them now uh, as a man in my 50s because a man in my 30s, I was too busy trying to get on. Yeah, I, I really... No, I would be a better dad now than I was then. In what way? It's because I'm more self-aware, and I think I, I think the comedies allowed me to do that. I think the life of li- it, it's it's a funny thing um, if you like success and achievements. I don't understand these people who are constantly, constantly, constantly not satisfied. What you were asking me before about the step going into comedy, I'd already won in my world. I'd won, and you know, I had I had a beautiful wife. I had a you know, whose dad was a dentist, so I'd already gone up. <laughs> you know what I mean, I'd already. And we we lived in a nice area, and if it went wrong, I knew I could get another job, and and I'd won, so I could never go back. And I think that's the that's the. The difference, really, when you the the consequence of getting it wrong yeah. was never felt as dramatic as it might have looked to other people. One of your sons is, has lost his hearing or is losing his hearing. Is that right? Yeah. I just I think back to the sort of challenges you've had, and I think we have a lot of parents that listen to this, and like all parents, they all feel like they're getting it wrong all of the time, and that's a genuine challenge for you, your son to deal with, but also for you as a family to deal with. And I suppose I just wonder with all the experiences that you've had, the kind of messages that you've given him for coping in, in adversity? He, he can hear with hearing aids and he's lost probably 70% of his hearing. Uh, well, it is 70%. But the, the band he can hear is like vocal stuff, but if an alarm bell goes off, he won't hear it. It's that kind of thing. So you're kind of not completely deaf so that you're in the deaf community, you're not hearing all the time yeah. so that you're in the hearing community. And that's where he's... It's been a real challenge for him. 
Uh, but what I found when we made that documentary is I did what you would do if your child lost his hearing. I wanted to fix it. Yeah. I wanted to get it right. I wanted to get it sorted. I'll I'll do it. What's wrong with it? Right, all right, I'll go and phone someone. And what he needed for me to go, I'll oh, just come here. Just mm. that. And uh, I guess I didn't have it in my locker. I didn't have it there. Do you have it now? I got it now. I don't know, I'm crying on the fucking telly <laughs> or whatever this is. But you know what I mean? I'm I'm you know what I mean? I'm emotional now in a way I wasn't then yeah. because then I was too I was too uh task orientated. I was too focused on going I I I know there's something wrong and I can find the answer. Yeah. And because I was working with medical people, I'll talk to them and I'll make all these connections and I'll and I'll fly it to America. We'll do mm. that. That'll do, that'll do. No, it's fine, I'll do that. But really, sometimes your kid just needs that. They don't need an answer. They just need yeah. safety. It reminds us of, we interviewed a guy called Charles Duhigg, like a Pulitzer Prize winning author, and he gave us a great way of understanding what you've just, what you've just beautifully illustrated, Johnny said. If you think at any stage with any individual, there's three H's they're looking for to help, to hear, or to hug them. And it'll always be one of those. And often breakdowns happen because... We think we're helping mm. when they don't want that. They just want to hug or... Well, they just want to be listened to. Yeah. Uh, and I... Um, yeah. Yeah, if there was a, a regret in my life, it would be that. I wouldn't be too hard on yourself though, right? Because I think that you've done what you needed to do at the stages when you needed to do them. Yeah. Like, how can you... We had a guest on who once said to us, if you'd lived the life that person's lived, you'd act exactly the same way. Oh, listen, right. we've been through, me and my wife had loads of conversations and, you know, about loads of things, you know what I mean? We got back together, but like every marriage is, we've had our ups and downs, been loads of stuff going on. And also what happened, I became famous when the kids were finding their own identity. So their own identity was then being, was being seen through a filter of other people going, oh, your dad's on the telly, go on, make us laugh. And they're going, well, I don't even sound like him because they grew up in Manchester, not Liverpool. You know what I mean? And there's all of those things, you know, You know, one of my sons, a dancer, he's not interested in football. Everyone goes, oh, your dad supports Liverpool. So you go, well, what's that got to do with me? So all of those things were going, when I see people who are famous and, you know, financially secure, and then they have kids, they, their, their world is is starting from the position of everybody knows where they fit in. Mm. Whereas, oh, their, their world was changing. I didn't know where to fit it in. Do you know what I mean? We didn't know. So all that we were all changing and we've looked at it loads of times, me and Melanie, and we've gone, you know what? On that day, what we were facing, that was the only decision we could have made yeah. because it was right. We never, ever took the easy decision. We never, ever did the thing that just suited us. We did the thing that felt right at the time. You know, at the start of this conversation and you said to us, what have you learned from all these conversations? What I'm now re reminded of is we've done, as I said at the start, about 300 of these. And we've worked out that high performance is doing the best you can where you are with what you've got. Yeah. And that's exactly what you've done. You've done the best you can where you were with what you had. And that, when you were a young dad, that's what you had at that time. Mm -hmm. You're now... a a wiser, older person, so you have something else. And I, and I think one of the best things you've said is that you made the decision to give up doing television because it wasn't servicing you anymore. That's not the act of a desperate person who's unfulfilled and looking to f to fill a void in their life. That's the act of a content, stable person who's now finally able to sit, have a conversation like this, look back on the life they've oh. lived. And I think this is the most healthy way to be now. Listen, you, you, I don't know why... I've been as emotional during this is because I have spoke about similar stuff in the past, but I think it's because I haven't spoke in this way, in this environment for a while. Uh, and I'm I'm more able to process it. You're right. So I, I am more content now than I've ever been. I'm interested in, you told us about your other son that that's a dancer. And again, like we talk in, often in stereotypes, how where you might assume that 
you a lad from Liverpool, you like your football, and you said that people go, oh, well, why doesn't your son like that? How did you end up having a different approach to encouraging your son to go down a route that you weren't familiar with? Oh, God, I... Uh, I, I it was funny, and I, I remember... Uh, um, when he was a kid, and um, there was a ballet came to Manchester, and he was about, I don't know, 12, something like that, and it was uh, Michael, I've got to say his name now, but the, the, the male... Uh, Guy who puts on these shows with all male dancers. Yeah, uh, um, oh, his name's gone. Uh, Saddle as well as he does yeah, it. He's brilliant, and he did it. He did a male, all male Swan Lake and stuff like that. Did your uh, boy dance? He went to watch it. He didn't dance in it, right? He... No, no, he went to watch it, and we were, he was about eleven, something like that, eleven or twelve. And I thought I want to show him that I don't know anything about it, but I want you to do it. I want you to love doing it. And it was on on a Monday, and I remember and on the on the Sunday or the Saturday, I'd taken the other two to go and watch Liverpool, and during the game stuff was happening, and I was saying like this, and then and I was explaining what was going on to them during the game, and then I went to the ballet, and I was going, why have they done that? <laughs> I was getting them to explain it to me, and I just I think it's I I I love. It's never, ever been something that I thought, oh, my God, we need to make him a boxer. I just love the fact that he went, this is what I want to do. Thank you so much for coming on this yeah, and being a ge genuine, not being a comedian, because I know it's so easy to be a comedian, yeah. right? And uh, every now and again, you want to do something and go, like we spoke about... If I didn't... We spoke about my mom, we spoke about the childhood situations... If I wanted this to sell tickets, I'd avoided all of that. I'd have been on here for an hour and just said a load of funny stuff. You know, well, no, no you, one's going to go, I tell you what, his dad went to prison, let's buy a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, 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 that this mugs the new last tour. Year. Let's buy a ticket. Um, that would be good, yeah. <laughs> so quick fire questions, John. The three non-negotiable behaviours that you think are most important in life? Uh, <laughs> right. Manners. Yep. 100% manners. I hate people with bad manners. Uh, respect everyone else. And the one thing that, as I leave, as this leaves my mouth, my wife and everyone who knows me well is going to go, you're taking the piss. Be on time. <laughs> <laughs> as I've got older, I've got more and more annoyed with people who are late, even though I've spent most of my life being the most late person in the world. <laughs> Fine. What advice would you give a teenage John? A teenage John. Wow. Uh, I think a teenage me, when I think back to me as a teenager, I'd say it'll be all right. It'll be all right. What's your biggest strength and what is your greatest weakness? Uh, my biggest strength, I think, is optimism. Uh, and my, my greatest weakness is uh, optimism is sometimes like bravery. If you have too much of it, it can go wrong. Very good. What's the single best piece of advice you've ever received and why? Oh, God. Single best piece of advice. I remember when I was sat with my mum and dad. I'd, I left school I, I, and I, I went back. I, the school I went to at the time... I, I hadn't really had the sixth form. They started to have a sixth form. 2,000 kids, seven people went to it. And I went on the first day and I turned up in jeans and he said, you can't have jeans, you've got to have slacks. I went, I'm not going to ask me, well, I'm not going home and say, can I have slacks? So I went and got a job. And I got a job in, um, in ICI as a male lad. Uh, and it was a good job. Most of my mates were on the... On, uh, schemes and all that That's I said, and I was getting 42 pound a week and I and I did it but I knew I wanted to get off the estate so I kept on doing A levels at night school and I bumped into an old teacher of mine uh, um, who said uh, Jeff Logan who said look he was my English teacher he said when you come back and do A levels would, would the school have you back and I went I, I, I'd already it was a term and I said I've got a job I, 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 I'll give me mum keep and I'm not coming back because at that time you went back to school, you, you got a uh, child allowance. I said, I'm not doing that. 
And he said, well, look, but this is your opportunity in the school and maybe work something out so that you can sign on the dole on the side and all this stuff, which actually happened. So so I went from £46 to £18 instead of £6.50. Remember all these numbers. And uh, so I went home to my mum and dad and, uh, and I said, I'm thinking of going back to school. And, we, and he was going, why? I said, because I want to do A-levels. And he was going, why? I said, because I want to go to university. And they're going, well, but what for? You've got a job. And ICI, you get your pension in ICI. I said, but I just want to do it. And he was going, why? And I said, I and I remember, I used to go to work. I used to get the bus at six o'clock in the morning. And we sat up. I was still in my wear clothes at midnight. And after spending all night of trying to talk me out of it, because I had the job, I remember my dad's words. He went, all right, done. He said, you've got to do it. Because if you don't try it, you will never know. And that's the best advice I could give anyone. I love that. And the final message for the audience that have enjoyed this remarkable conversation. What would you like to leave ringing in their ears? Your, your one golden rule, if you like, or your one final message of how we can all live a high-performance life? That. Give it a go. Because if you don't give it a go, you'll never know. Brilliant. John, thank you so much. Thank you. I feel, I feel like I've been a, a confession or therapy or something. But this thank is you. great. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. That was special, man, honestly. That was really special. Struggling to find the motivation? Try this instead. Take it professionally, not personally. Why are we postponing love and community and friendship? I'm not worried if anyone fails, as long as we are changing things for the good. To have those kinds of friendships, I think, are absolutely essential to being what we would call a high-performance human being. Take back control over your happiness. Give the high-performance app a try. Then see how you feel.